in about my business. Okay, let's see. Clicking all the buttons. Can everyone see my slides? Yes. Yes. Awesome. All right, let me set my little timer because I, I will tell you, I have never had to present in six minutes. So <laughs> usually I have like an hour. Um, so this is going to be fun. It's nice and quick, get to the, the juicy parts. So um, as you heard, my name is Dr. Laura McGuire, and I always use this picture when I'm introducing myself because I love it. It's very foreshadowing of who I would become. So if you can't see it, it's a picture of me. Um, I'm about two years old and I have a broom in one hand. I'm dragging a doll behind me with the other and I'm carrying a bag in my mouth. And I say, this is clearly depicting that I was supposed to be a, a born multitasker and someone who had a lot of pots boiling at all times. So I started the National Center for Equity and Agency in 2018. But before that, I had all of the kind of cumulative events that led to me wanting to start this business. So really those initial seeds were planted in my personal story. I got my GED when I was 23. Uh, I was a high school dropout and got married very, very young and uh, really didn't believe in myself, suffered a lot of different forms of violence in that marriage. Um, had two wonderful children from it, which I'm grateful for, but I knew that education and education, particularly around violence prevention, were the things that were getting me out of a negative situation, and that that's something I wanted to do for other people as well. Um, so I became a educator. I became a teacher. My first job was in a one-room schoolhouse for teens, and then I worked with a lot of young people who were in and out of the juvenile justice system, and absolutely love that. And so I went on to grad school and became a sexologist. And I focus on trauma, again, violence prevention in particular, as well as the response to violence and the intersections therein of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, I've done that for universities and the military. And I found that when I was in those roles, there were a lot of other people that wanted this information, wanted additional insights, books, trainings, et cetera, um, that I was able to potentially offer, but I was stuck at one institution. So I decided, as I said, in 2018, to come back to Florida, I was in New York at the time, working for the government, and start this organization. I am still not done with school. See, I, I really believe education is important. And I am back in school in seminary. I'm getting my master's of divinity. So who is the National Center for Equity and Agency? We are a group of scholar survivors. So we all have advanced degrees and experience in a particular field. We all identify as survivors of some form of interpersonal violence. And we very much see this work of continuing these conversations, particularly in spaces that haven't necessarily had them before, um, as our calling. We do everything from certifications to research, consulting, do a lot of training, and our topics kind of run that gamut from restorative justice to consent to trauma-informed care. So one of the common issues we see is that people are aware these are problems, right? They'll say, yeah, I see this on the news all the time. This is a major issue, but I'm not 100% sure what the answer is, or Maybe they go to a conference or something or they Google it and they find some kind of cookie cutter thing, something that's like an online module. And they're like, oh, good, we can check the box. We've solved the problem. But oftentimes they'll find out, oh, no, it's, it's still there. It's still going on because we haven't addressed it holistically and we haven't gotten to the roots of the issue. And so our three-pronged approach when we work with schools or um, corporate uh, entities is that we offer first analysis. We really look at the research of that organization, what's going on, where the areas of strength are and where the areas of concern lie. And then we create customized trainings around that. And then we look at strategic planning as well. Not just, that's nice, you did a workshop, that's great, what are we gonna do with it? It stays there forever. No, you have to create an actionable solution long-term so that you get the most for your money and time investment. 
our biggest thing right now is that we're really developing a lot of certifications around this. And again, we're developing them for for areas, for fields that don't talk about this stuff. So right now, our two biggest successes have been with insurance companies. We have an entire insurance company that is invested for two years of certification for all of their um, claims adjusters and brokers. And then we have more and more attorneys who are interested in our certification options. Next year, we'll be exploring creating programs for clergy and um, teachers. All right, so again, we see the issue, why now we have to do something about it. And again, there are other solutions, but oftentimes they're not research informed. They're not longitudinal. They're not here for the, the long game, right? They're more of a sprint and this is really a marathon. So we work with schools, colleges, Title IX departments, um, student conduct, military, like I mentioned, our corporate um, partners and Again, really expanding certifications because certifications are amazing. They allow people to differentiate themselves and say, I'm committed to this practice. I'm not just trained on it. I'm in, invested in this fully. Secondly, it allows them to then reach the people that are looking for someone with those competencies. And third, ah, see, there's my timer. Third, it allows for accountability if they advertise themselves as such, and then they're not providing those kinds of services people can let us know and we can have that conversation. I did it, six minutes. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. I look forward to hearing your questions. Nice job, very nice. Thank you for sharing. If anyone has questions, please put in the chat or feel free to raise your hand. Uh, I'm curious, uh, first of all, this is fascinating and I, and I wanna talk to you even further about your foray into the insurance industry. Uh, for a number of reasons, but um, what has been, ha have you had to do a lot of marketing for this? Like, how do you, how are you initially making contact with your, with these folks? How do you find people or how do they find you? What is that? Can you maybe describe that a little bit more? Yeah, no, I mean, I, especially in the beginning that that is always the hardest part, right? <laughs> you you have this wonderful product and people don't know it exists. So, I mean, it's it's all been 100% bootstrapping. Like I have no investors. I had no money. I was a single mother for seven years. I just got remarried. Um, and so I was just out there on my own and going to conferences, doing speaking engagements like this a lot back then, um, and, and just reaching out to people. And I was fortunate, I had been a writer for many years at that point. So a lot of journalists knew to contact me. And when there were topics that would come up, I would um, either be interviewed or write a piece for them. I've been in Fortune Magazine, et cetera, writing different articles on these topics. So that's really how it got started. And even our insurance client, I would have never thought to advertise trauma-informed care to an insurance company, um, but I was interviewed for an article on our certification for attorneys in a law magazine. They read that and said, we're kind of similar, like we don't have any Psych 101 in our, in our training or in our educational backgrounds for the most part, and we have a lot of secondary trauma. Right, we have to watch these videos and look at pictures and hear people's traumatic stories. And so, could you create a program for us? And I was like, "Yeah, let's do it." Awesome, awesome. So, what, and I hope everyone hears what you're talking about because what I hear you saying is, you weren't shy. You really believed in what you were doing, and you weren't shy about it. You were taking every opportunity to find a microphone and share it with the world, and not just talk about yourself, but share the value, share what you're doing. And that kind of started building and got you the opportunity. So thank you. That, that's absolutely awesome. Uh, Eric has a question. Do clients ever worry that if they hire your organizations, they're admitting that they have a problem? So he says, I would think some organizations would worry that they look like they're admitting they have a problem. So it doesn't right. look good if they hire you. How do you balance the image versus uh, the need? Right. So, I mean, I, I definitely think that's a common issue, and particularly when there's some kind of like cold marketing experience. If I'm reaching out to people, then they're often like, well, we don't we don't have those issues. So we're good. You find someone who does. Right. Um, and I think that one of the ways it's been framed is, you know, it's more like a sprinkler system. 
right? You have sprinkler systems in your office because you know there could be a fire and you don't want to put them in when the fire is already going on, right? You want them there ready to go. So really preventative training and strategic planning and policy design, et cetera, with us is that sprinkler system. It's saying, we know these things happen everywhere and we want to be on the cutting edge of preventing it. And, and again, we want to differentiate ourselves and say, this is something we're deeply committed to. So we're investing in it and then they'll attract those kinds of clients. Excellent. Uh, Michael would like to know, what do you know now that you wish you knew when you started two years ago? It's a great question. <laughs> That's such a good question. I wish I knew how hard it would be. <laughs> You know, because, and I'll, you know, I'll be very honest, like about the intersectional pieces of being an entrepreneur, right? That we're not all starting from the same launching pad. We're not. Um, I didn't have 20, 30 years of network connections to pull from. Um, also, I had started my career a little bit later than some other people, you know, getting my GED later on in life and then having to start from there. And so I would sometimes talk to people. We're like, yeah, I just call up all my friends. They're all executives at companies. They hire me. It's word of mouth. Boom. I had a huge career the first year. That's great. I'm so happy for you. But, you know, and again, even in that situation, for some people, it's not the same. So for myself, I wish I knew there are so many mitigating factors that can set you up for success so that you're at the head of the race. And if you're not to be patient to keep going, to keep strategizing and innovating, figuring out different things that work. Um, one other thing that I think is terrible advice that I heard a lot was stick to one product. Just do your one thing and do it very well. For me, that wasn't it. I needed to cast a wide net, see what I caught and be flexible to innovate from there. Excellent advice. Uh, Denny, you have a question, go ahead and unmute. You need to unmute though first, Mr. Denny. You're still muted, Denny. Okay. There we go. That's there better. you go. That's it. Uh, Laura, are you familiar with Dr. Kevin Sharon? He used to be the Orange County Medical Director. No, I haven't. I haven't connected with him. Well, he's actually running a free clinic in Lakeland now, but it's easy to get a hold of him. When he was in residency in Chicago in the '90s, he created an app, a universal app for battered women. No matter where you are in the world. Based on your zip code, you just go to the app and it gives you where you can get help. I think it'll provide that for you free. It'd be a nice thing to have on your website. So if somebody is in danger or they're being beaten up, that they can get help right away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and they're- and they're... I can put you in touch with them. It'd be a great thing. And I don't think he's going to charge you for it because we tried to monetize it and he was giving it away to the whole country. So I'm sure that he'll give it away to you. And it's, it's a really a great thing. Yeah, no, that that is. And there's so many, there are lots of- um, both uh, hotlines and our national and apps out there. And that is, that is a great resource. Thank you for sharing that. And also we have um, programs for um, medical providers, particularly on LGBTQ competencies. So maybe I'll connect with him over that. Sure. Awesome. James question is, he's curious about whether or not you also work directly with venues or other locations about how to create safe, equitable uh, and accessible spaces in the physical world. Yeah, so we do we do do a good bit with I think we're talking about universal accessibility, um, but that's not that's not our main competency. So I have I have contractors that I work with that I bring on for those particular projects that that is their area of expertise is you know their subject matter experts just on accessibility, um, but we infuse it into the other discussions we're having around violence prevention and intersectionality. Absolutely. I identify as a spoonie, by the way. We put spoon theory into all of our trainings. Uh, Rupert would like to know, have you interfaced with people working to bring awareness to human trafficking, uh, including those uh, who deal with those consequences? Yes. So, I mean, human trafficking is really interesting because it's gotten, I think, uh, more attention just in the past five years than it has um, previously. And um, we do do a bit with that, but really our focus is more on um, sexual misconduct as far as stalking and consent violations and more of the things that are widely pervasive in our everyday spaces where we interact. 
Um, and there are many organizations that really focus on the trafficking experience. But the good thing is, if you know trauma-informed care, if you know if young people are trained on consent and what healthy relationships look like, then it's the ideal primer from, for some of those more specific nuanced topics as well. We're trying Got to, it. on human trafficking, a lot of churches have started doing that, but they're not doing the other pieces so it's it's really not a holistic approach and that's one of the things we're trying to do that makes sense uh pam's had a question pamela uh, she wants to know do you live in central florida which i, I think you said you live up on the um palm coast northeast yes. florida i live uh, in palm coast our firm is based out of volusia um, and we've done a lot in orlando we've worked with anna escamani's office we've written some aprs with them um so yeah we're we're not far away at all well, she, she does some amazing work. Uh, she says she, she works at juvenile prevention programming and she'd love to connect with you. So uh, yeah. I, I highly recommend uh, that you do connect with her. She's doing amazing stuff. Uh, Michael has a question. Do you, or how do you determine your pricing? What's your, in other words, what's your business model like? Let's just go there. Yeah. So, I mean, I think uh, our pricing has very much evolved. Um, again, I think starting out, that's one of the hardest things is figuring out what, what is the price point where people see the value in you and that you're, you're making enough to cover your expenses and be compensated fairly. Um, but, but also being realistic about the market. And, and again, certain people have, I think, um, created platforms for themselves where they're able to ask for a certain amounts of money that a lot of other people, when they ask the same can't. So for example, in the speaker world, um, a lot of um, men who are Caucasian in particular are able to get prices that a lot of my fellow female speakers or non-binary speakers and people of color aren't, aren't getting compensated. So that has been an evolving thing. But I think, um, I mean, our business model is really, you know, getting to that place where we know what we should be asking for. And I think more than anything, it's not about getting and this is going back to like lessons I've learned. It's not about getting more clients. It's about getting better clients for us. People who are like, yes, we believe in this. We're fully invested. What, what is a fair price for you? And there's no negotiation. There's no back and forth. There's no, you know, saying, I don't think it's really worth that. Um, and I think that that's, that's so important for any industry is attracting those people who really get you. Plus, that's such a fun place to be. Like you said, there's no back and forth. It's it's obvious. It's simple, uh, and the value proposition is there. there there's mm -hmm. no there's no selling at that point, right? There's no convincing yeah. or chasing because that's the most frustrating part of sales for a lot of folks. Yeah. Uh, James is clarifying his earlier question. He, he says he means, for example, working with gyms or fitness studios or like local parks and rec centers. I guess as opposed to some of the bigger like the insurance companies and some of those corporations. Are you doing anything on more the, I guess, the, uh, the smaller okay. level? I also added another small clarification just because I, sure. sorry about that, Josh. It's further down. If you... Yeah. James... Oh, there's more. James, you just want to just go ahead and mute yourself and yeah. ask. Yeah, ask sure. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> so Laura, I was just curious because uh, the example that I wrote in the chat was that I know there used to be, and unfortunately probably still is a very large problem with sexual assaults in Walmart parking lots, right? As an example of, of this is what I meant with more like, actual physical spaces as opposed to in the workplace or, or at school. Um, and, you know, this could also apply to, to gyms or other places where, you know, in particular women, but anybody might find themselves walking alone to their car. I see I froze. Can you hear me? Yep. We yeah, can okay. can hear you. So I'm just curious if you, if you do any work in, in that kind of arena about, uh, I mean, there's obviously there could be I don't want to say user, but but public education about where to be more aware and, and try to protect yourself better. Uh, but I'm just curious if you also work with actual locations, you know, venues, I mean, even sporting arenas, uh, somebody going to the magic game and then walking the, through the parking lot at night. Is this is this something that is is on your radar? Yes, I mean, it's definitely on my radar. And I mean, I think I, so I, I founded the first sexual violence prevention program at the University of Houston, which is a huge campus. They have 43,000 students um, and a lot of football games. And so this was this was always, you know, a major concern. I will say I, I have been sad to see not a lot of 
physical spaces are really, at least they have not been engaging with us. I've seen other entrepreneurs in this space and speakers and trainers, et cetera, not have a lot of luck with them either. Um, I think there is definitely, for whatever reason, that gap of this isn't a problem from our perspective or it's not a liability we want to address for whatever reason, um, but we know that it's an ongoing issue. As far as kind of that um, violence prevention piece from the standpoint of uh, risk awareness, I think is what you're talking about. And we used to do a lot of that, particularly college campuses, right? Like a rape whistle and um, a lot of like, like how to walk at night, to putting your keys between your fingers and such. And I've, it had great intentions, but what it ended up doing more than anything was furthering victim blaming. So instead it was often like, oh yeah, you didn't use your whistle and you didn't tap the app three times. Like right now there's um, circle of six, right? And all these different things, you didn't do those things, you had the tools, therefore you're partially responsible. So we've really shift the focus to instead talking about again, that no one is to blame, helping a lot of people who most of these situations are it's less likely that someone attacks you in, in the parking lot. It's more likely that someone you know manipulates you and grooms you, even as an adult, to force um, a, some kind of situation. And so that's, that's where we're really focusing our energy because statistically we know that's the biggest risk. Um, and the other piece is more bystander support. So having other people looking out in those parking lots and saying, if I see this commotion, if I see someone even looking uncomfortable, it's okay to go over and intervene and make sure they're okay. And if they're not, to do something about it. Um, so the approach has kind of evolved in that way. Okay, thank you very much for elaborating. I appreciate it. Awesome, thank you, yes. And Rupert, uh, just a final uh, mention on the uh, human trafficking. There's a lady here, Jan Edwards in Central Florida. Uh, if you do need a resource there or want to connect more about what's going on here, she's a fantastic person to talk to. So um, that'll be in the chat. And uh, VJ actually has, gives a link, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's got the link there. So that's yeah. fantastic. Uh, Trevor's got a question. When you say accessibility, so many people with disabilities suffer from abuse as, you know, they're targeted more for people that are less likely to fight back or less able to bring abuse awareness to other people. Uh, do you have capacity to serve the disability community? Yes. So that's, that is something we do a lot. I'm also a professor at Widener University and I teach um, accessibility around sexuality. And, um, and no, it's a, it's a huge problem. I think one of the things we're doing, we talk, like I said, we, we educate primarily the people who are then providing services. So with crisis centers, um, a lot of crisis centers are not accessible. They do not provide you know, a wide variety of tools and services for people with different kinds of disabilities. Working with Tile 9 coordinators about neurodivergence, and that also goes into the restorative justice piece. So we have seen a lot of students charged with things like stalking and harassment who are neurodivergent and really just are struggling with understanding social cues. Um, and again, when we work with the people who are doing this, this kind of messaging, um, helping them to realize the, the ableism, the bias that they have about what a survivor even looks like and who they should be talking to. And a lot of times they are completely ignoring um, the conversation around disability and assault, or again, even dating violence and manipulation. Um, so making that more of something that's a priority for them in realizing that yes, statistically, these are students or community members who are at some of the greatest risk. So we need to put a lot of our energy into that conversation versus where it's maybe been in the past 20 years um, where a lot of people have been missed. Awesome. Well, hey, we, I've got to send it over to Eric for our last question. But again, thank you for everything that you're doing. This has been very, very eye opening, especially for me. So. All right, Eric. All right. You. Laura, great job. And uh, uh, we answered a lot of great questions, too. Um, <clears throat> what else can we as a community do for you? Hmm. Um, I think I, I've seen some great contacts in here. I mean, feel free to also reach out to me after this and, um, you know, let me know if you want to either connect to other people or um, with yourself directly. And certainly a lot of the spaces that have been discussed, you know, schools, um, physical venues, um, 
sports stadiums, et cetera, or if there's corporations that you intersect with, making them aware of this conversation and seeing if they're open to discussing it further. Because again, we all have the ability to be part of this change, but we have to prioritize it. All right, excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Okay, and then next up, I wanted to share this one more time so everybody can see Michael's cool logo. Uh, Michael, tell us what's happening in the world of the Fast and Furious. With Coastal Auto, Auto Connection. All right, can you hear me? Yes. All right, I'm just jumping over. You should see my main slide. Yes. All right, perfect. So thank you guys so much for having me back. I um, really appreciate the opportunity to be here. I'm actually sporting my, my 1 million cup shirt because I am an organizer in Daytona Beach. So it's exciting to uh, step away from that and know that it's still running because we have a great team there, but it enables me to be a part of your community. And, um, you know, as I've heard mentioned earlier, this 1 million cups is so great. Um, I want to make sure to take advantage and speak in more chapters. So uh, definitely going to do that. And Laura, we'd love to have you back in Daytona Beach so you can share an update on what you're doing. Uh, we are back in person in that community. So we hope to see you there when your time permits. But um, many of you may know me. I did come and speak, uh, you know, over a year ago to this group. At that time, I was uh, talking about a program called the Florida Virtual Entrepreneur Center. Um, and I'm, my background is I grew up in an entrepreneurial family. I then went to work for an organization for 13 years. And I was an entrepreneur inside the organization. And that's where the Virtual Entrepreneur Center came from. 13 years ago, I was hired to help create a platform to connect entrepreneurs. Uh, and I did that successfully for, for the last 13 years, but um, always had this itch for entrepreneurship and um, always had kind of side, side hustle things going on. And you know, I decided in July of this year that I was going to uh, make the full-time transition, just go full-time entrepreneur and really dive into something that I'm very passionate about, which is cars um, and automobiles. I grew up, you'll see the next image on screen. This is my family's automotive repair business that's been in Daytona Beach for about 50 years. Um, and they've been in the automotive repair side of the, uh, the car industry exclusively. So Laura, I heard you mention about casting a wide net. You know, my family went specifically for auto repair and uh, works on a variety of vehicles, but that's what they've always done. And I've always had this itch to say, why couldn't we get into the dealer side, right? You know, buy and sell used cars. And so um, I launched the business Coastal Auto Connection about two years ago, actually, as a side hustle. Um, and it has, uh, it's growing quickly and has become very busy. So hence the need to go full-time entrepreneur and really maximize uh, what we're doing. Uh, kind of what got me in, you know, besides my family's involvement in the car world, um, what kind of got me into the dealer side was actually this lady you see on screen was somebody that I worked with. Uh, and she came up to me one day and she said, you know, Michael, uh, my husband bought all our cars. I don't know anything about buying cars. I'm kind of nervous to do that. Would you help me do that? And that little light bulb went off, right? I'm like, well, wait a second. You know, if I can help Ellen buy a car and I never have to own the inventory, I'm in a pretty great spot, right? Because I provide the service, my overhead low, um, and really, I just have to connect to more people. So uh, being a broker is something that, you know, really anyone could do as long as they have the knowledge and, and the drive to make it happen. Uh, the state of Florida does not require you if you're going to broker car deals to become a registered dealer. Uh, so I was doing this for a little bit of time, getting my feet wet in the industry. Um, and then the image that you see on here is actually the Jacksonville port uh, in Jacksonville, Florida. I was there um, uh, when I actually exported my first car. To, uh, to Europe. And what happened at that time, it triggered. So I had a friend who said, Michael, I know somebody in, in Europe that wants to bring cars from America to Europe. Uh, could you make that happen? And I started investigating it and found out that at that point, you have to become a licensed Florida dealer because you have to take possession of the car, go through the process of exportation, and then send it uh, to wherever you're going to send it. And so I did that and, and had a good run doing that and enjoyed that, learned a lot. Um, it's depending on what type of cars you're dealing with the age of the cars it means certain things uh, but then as you guys all know covid hit exporting or you know uh, exporting cars pretty much stopped because all the ports overseas were closed down america opened up a lot quicker than other countries buying power stronger here 
Um, a lot of factors caused me to pivot. So I pivoted and said, um, you know, the bills are still coming in. I got to pay those, my, my warehouse, my licenses, my insurance. So I started focusing on selling cars in the United States. Uh, and that's what I've been doing since, since COVID. Um, this is kind of how I keep the lights on in my business. I've never stopped the brokering side. I still do that. Um, but I've gotten into having my own inventory, and I'm exclusively focused on uh, cars from the 1980s, 1990s, and 2000s. These are enthusiast automobiles, uh, very desirable cars, cars that I grew up, you know, lusting after. Um, Gone in 60 Seconds or Fast and Furious. You've ever seen those movies? Sort of that era of car. Uh, got you know guys like me and gals like me excited about vehicles. Um, so I'm offering a lot of different services and it enables me to sort of plug in in different ways. And um, when my inventory is going through rejuvenation process and I don't have any cars for sale, I can backfill my time with, you know, setting up transportation, sourcing cars for individuals. Um, and what I'm really wanting to lean into more is going out and speaking and sharing my story, because I know there are other entrepreneurs that um, have dreams and ambitions. And if I can share a little bit of inspiration and knowledge, uh, then I, I I feel like I've, I've helped make a difference, um, you know, in their their outlook. So uh, leading into that a little bit more, but this is basically how my company makes money. Uh, I would not have a company without 16 or more other entrepreneurs. Um, and this is the most valuable piece of, of my company. It's the relationships I have with my mechanic, my tire people, my detailer, you know, my painter, my upholstery person, my software system that I use to produce the sale paperwork. Uh, it, it means a lot. I have no employees. I've set my business up to where um, I'm essentially contracting out all the work that I do um, on the cars that I have in inventory, um, or if I'm transporting them, I don't have my own transportation you know, uh, rig. I outsource that to different uh, providers that I have based on where the cars need to go around the country. So uh, the success of other entrepreneurs is really the success of mine. Uh, it's why I care so much about the people I do business with. It's why I'm involved in One Million Cups as an organizer because I want to see more entrepreneurs be successful uh, because I need them and we need them. Here's a couple of examples of the cars. I mentioned again, 80s, 90s, and 2000s. This was a 2005 BMW, uh, very desirable car, has a performance package on it. Um, I sell a lot of cars through Auto Trader, eBay, and through online auctions. Uh, this particular vehicle set a record on an online auction for the convertible model. Uh, this was a one owner out of California. Uh, zero rust, 20,000 miles, just an immense car, uh, very desirable in the enthusiast community right now. Uh, 91 BMW, uh, 318 IS, one-year-only car, five-speed manual transmission. Believe it or not, this car actually had 165,000 original miles on it. Uh, they're so hard to find that even with that high mileage, people will still pay uh, still pay a good a good price for them. And, you know, when you buy a car from me, from Coastal Auto Connection, I am extremely picky. So the cars that I buy are cars that I would personally keep and hold on to forever. Um, so you're getting the best. And that's how I've set myself up in the industry. Uh, low volume, but the best quality. Every little detail is done. Every little plastic piece that has a scratch on it essentially gets changed. Um, mechanical side is all you know set and ready to go. So it's turnkey. Uh, this is actually a pretty rare car too, an Acura TL from the 2005 era. This car had a six-speed manual transmission in it, very hard to find. And uh, Acura Honda stopped making this car because it was so powerful. Uh, they were having a lot of warranty claims um, from their buyers. So uh, just that sort of rarity factor around cars uh, helps drive up the price. Certainly the used car market, uh, as you guys know, is doing really well right now. Uh, this was a 60s Lincoln that I sourced for someone. So this is a client of mine that said, hey, I want this car. I never took it in on inventory. I actually found the car in Orlando, went over, inspected it, set it up, and then cut the deal uh, with the guy that was selling it on behalf of my client. Uh, M3 that I set up transportation from Daytona Beach, Florida, enclosed trailer to California. So I've shipped them all over the, all over the country. Um, I know this question is going to come, but I'll just throw it out there now. Again, being an organizer, I know I kind of know what's coming. Um, you know, but I'm, I'm, I'm really, I like to be deeply in touch with my customer. I find that the way I can maximize value that I provide and, and what I do and stay focused on um, what it is I want to own sort of in this industry is to be in touch with my customers. So, you know, car shows, you'll see me there. Um, online forums, I'm involved in a lot of those. Um, so, you know, if, you, if you're interested in cars, you have pain points around cars, I'd love to hear your feedback on that. 
Um, certainly my industry, you know, people are buying online pictures and videos. Very few people actually come to my location. So reviews, you know, they want to see that they're the people that they're going to do business with have uh, good reviews. And of course, you know, referrals, that's the number one thing um, that I think makes every business go around. If you want to contact me, there's my contact info. Love the chat cars, make a connection if I can. Um, you know, whatever it is, talk entrepreneurship. So uh, that's my story and I'm going to stick to it. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you for sharing, man. This is great. Uh, I just have to say a side note. I, my wife has a 2003 BMW X5 and I know more about BMW engines than I ever wanted to know after two consecutive weekends of taking that thing apart and putting it back together. So for what it's worth, I now know a lot about the BMW engine. Uh, <clears throat> but it, it seems like you're, as you probably know, uh, the car industries are very commoditized, right? There's a lot of people out there doing this kind of stuff. And I just want to make a comment that your energy and, and your passion for what you're doing really comes through. And, what, and when you speak, take some time and create that brand, create that message. If you can create a brand and really make sure that gets articulated, that gets that energy out there, you're going to be off to the races, you know, so to speak. So uh, Rupert's got a, question, uh, got a question. Have you been attending the local car meets? Are you, because I, I see, but I see Rupert at all the local car meets. He's out there. Uh, looking at all the cool cars. Are, are you doing stuff like that to maybe advertise or to kind of get your name out there? Yeah, absolutely. Cars and coffee, um, not necessarily in the Orlando area, more in the Daytona Beach area, because that's, that's where I'm at. As you guys know, World Center Racing's here with NASCAR. So they have um, one Daytona has car shows on a regular basis. They just did the Turkey Rod run out here. I've been going to that for as long as I can remember. Um, you know, really when I go to those places, um, I'm, I'm more seeking to meet people, not necessarily push my business. Um, I, I want to, uh, you know, be in touch with the customer. I like to see what cars people are huddling around. Um, you know, right now, you know, Toyota Land Cruisers or Lexus Land Cruisers, extremely desirable uh, trucks or SUVs, um, wagons. Uh, you know, Volvo wagons, BMW wagons, Audi wagons, extremely desirable. So I'm kind of going to those places, you know, of course, to meet people, but looking with my eyes wide open to see, you know, what folks are huddling around uh, to give me some intelligence on what I can go back and start researching to purchase, uh, become more familiar with. You will see if you look on my website that I, I am buying and selling a lot of BMWs because I know that world. I spent a lot of time researching and understanding those cars and that was a car I grew up and lusted after. So I, you know, I just love those, but I have dabbled in other vehicles, Jaguars. Um, uh, you saw the Acura, uh, British cars, MGs. Um, so, you know, I, 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 again, studying the markets really what's driving some of that. And then of course I read the forums and, you know, the online auctions to see, you know, where, what people are wanting, what they desire. Okay, cool. Uh, Eric's got a question. Do you, do people contact you because they want a particular kind of car or do they just come to you and say, Hey, get me something cool or find me something? Yeah, normally um, I, I don't normally like the customers that say, uh, go find me something cool. Uh, no disrespect to them. Uh, when I find something cool and show it to them, they're like, yeah, that's not really what I want. <laughs> and I, I find something else cool. And then it's like, that's not really what I want either. So um, I've learned to, uh, sort of ask questions to get closer to what really up in their mind um, so that I'm not spending a lot of time finding things that they're not really truthfully interested in. So um, I prefer the clients that come and say, hey, Michael, I want, you know, a 1998 BMW M3, you know, in a Storio blue, four door, blah, 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 blah. Um, and if they don't give me all that information, then I'm going to ask them for it. The folks who come in and say, hey, you know, I just want a cool car. It's like, well, what, what do you mean by that? What's a cool car to you? Is it a convertible? Is it a coupe? Is it a sedan? Is, you know, uh, a lot of people uh, want manual transmission vehicles, um, you know, so that, so that element comes in too. So, yeah, I mean, you know, you get people reaching out and, you know, I had a guy from California who was looking for one and, you know, I just couldn't find it uh, quick enough and he wound up buying something else, you know, which is okay. Um, but the flip side, I've had, I had a client, he, he didn't want to wait. Uh, for me to go through the rejuvenation of a car, he, he called me and said, hey, I want this car that I see you have. I told him it's going to be about two months for me to finish the rejuvenation process on the car before it's going to be ready to send it to you. He, first, he said, okay. 
then uh, a couple of weeks later, he calls me back. He says, hey, I bought, I went ahead and bought a car that I saw and uh, I congratulated him, wished him well, many, you know, miles of smiles and all that. Two weeks later, he calls me back and he says, I made the biggest mistake. This is, this is a money pit. I should have waited for you. Um, and that's the reputation. That's sort of where uh, I want my business to be in the market is to, you know, if you want the very best car that's been sorted and vetted and inspected and gone through, um, and it is not a project in any way. I mean, you get in, you turn the key and you go, then you want to buy a car from, from Coastal Auto Connection. You want, and you want my eyes on it because if you, if I took you in my garage right now, you know, it's, uh, I'm very picky when it comes to my cars. Even my, I have two kids, my wife, we have a van. I have the cleanest van that kids eat in and, you know, drink in and, and have all their toys in. Like if you looked at the van, you wouldn't believe it's a 2004 with 130,000 miles on it because it's, it's mint. Um, so, so that's just where I want my company and my reputation to be in the industry. Certainly, you guys see there's dealers down every street uh, that you drive on, you know, selling everyday cars. But for me, I want it to be low volume, high quality, the best of the best, and uh, really focused on, you know, enthusiast vehicles from the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. Awesome. So it seems like you have a genius here or something really special, like, kind of like a, a, a system approach. But have you thought about how you might be able to scale this or you might be able to, uh, yeah, I guess, I guess just scale it. Like how, how it, can you, can you take your genius? Can you make a system out of it? Can this be something <laughs> that you can uh, broaden to not just you only? Have, have you thought about that? Is that something you're interested in doing or you just want to keep this uh, small and local and very personal? Yeah, it's, it is a good question, Josh. It's something that is certainly on my mind and I, it's a struggle to, to decide, you know, at this point in time, which direction I want to go. I'm happy. I'm comfortable. I was blessed that I had a successful career for 13 years where I've always lived a life where I just want to be comfortable. Like I, I'm not looking to live extravagant. I want, you know, what matters to me is uh, a great education for my, my kids in, in, in their future, um, being a part of my community you know, and being able to just live a comfortable life. So I had always sort of saved money and that positioned me well to make a transition to full-time entrepreneur uh, because I get that question a lot, as you know, I see the inventory you have, how you're affording it. Well, I'm self-funded uh, because I was patient in my former career and I saved money and I lived a, a you know, a low overhead life. And so now um, I, I, I talk to other dealers that are operating businesses similar to mine and, and they're bigger. And some of the time, you know, when I'm talking to them, they say to me, you know, I, I love where you're at because I was there once and then I got big and it's become a lot of headaches. And so that there's challenges there with that. So the, the, the scale piece, I think for me, if I scale it, I need to bring more of, more of it in-house because there's a quality control factor. Um, so I had great relationships with those 16 plus entrepreneurs that I showed you guys on screen earlier, but I also had plan B and plan C, meaning other painters or other upholstery people. And what I'm actually finding in this industry is that, you know, your painters, your upholstery people, your mechanics, your, um, you know, tire people, it's a lot of, uh, you know, more senior type folks, folks that are a little bit older, you know, and, and you're not seeing a lot of younger people in those trades. And so that is more of a red, sort of a, there's like a radar up in my mind of, you know, I got to keep making sure I have relationships with people who can provide those services so that I can continue to have a business as the guys that are doing it now sort of age out and retire. Uh, you know, my upholstery guy, he reminds me every time I go see him, hey, I'm not going to be here forever. So, you know, yeah. uh, what's that mean for your business? So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at all of that. Again, full-time entrepreneur for me transitioned July 1st of this year. I've been drinking from a fire hose every day since. It's been a blessing. I love it. I'm not, I wouldn't trade it for the world. I would tell anybody on this line right now that what I wished I would have done sooner is gone full-time entrepreneur. I wish I would have done what you all on this line are doing much sooner, um, but I'm not sad or you know resentful of how things played out. It played out, I believe, for a reason and prepared me for where I am now. Awesome. And my question really was coming from a place of, uh, not so much on your side, but the value you provide and making sure more people have access to that value. So, sorry, my phone's going Well, crazy. and I, you know, that's where leaning into the speaking a little bit more, you know, yeah. if I can get out to the National Dealers Associations or to SEMA or some of these bigger car show type conference things that happen, 
you know, and I can get up on stage and be paid to speak about, um, you know, what I've done, what I've seen so that that can empower other dealers, then yeah, I could, I could see that, um, you know, speaking, you know, we all, all of us on this phone and those that didn't make it today, like we have wisdom, okay, that other people want. And I can tell you from my world and my industry, if you go look at how to set up a Florida dealership, there is no information. And you're dealing with a lot of government agencies. And it, just a quick example, I'm standing in line at the DM, DMV one day to process a sale, a Florida sale. So if I sell you a car in Florida, I actually dislike that the most because I have to do everything for you. If you're a buyer in Florida and you buy a car from me because I'm a Florida dealer, you never step foot in the DMV. I have to go to the DMV and do the full transfer for you, get you a new title, your plate, and all that jazz. It takes a lot of time. And that's why you see dealers, not me, but de dealers will charge you $500 or $1,000 dealer fee. It's because they have to do those steps and those work for you after you sign the paperwork. So I'm standing at the DMV one day. I'm there four hours, right? What entrepreneur running their enterprise has four hours to go spend at the DMV to process a sale? Um, and I see this lady walk up to the counter and she, she drops off, she hands this folder to the clerk and the clerk says, I'll see you later. And so I looked at the clerk and I said, well, what's up with that? And she goes, oh, well, if you want to just drop it off and pick it up later, we'll let you do that. And I said to the lady, I said, you know, ma'am, very respectfully, you could have told me that. Like when I walked up here four hours ago and said, I'm here to process a deal, you told me to take a number and go sit down. So where I'm going with that is that, you know, we all learn through what we do every single day. There are other entrepreneurs in your industries, in my industry, that want to know those pitfalls, those speed bumps, those roadblocks before they get to them. And that, my friends, is value for you to package however you want to package it, YouTube videos, training sessions, one-on-ones. Me, I want to go out and speak about it speak about what it takes to set up a dealership, at least in the state of Florida, because I know that, um, so that other people can do it quicker, better, faster. And there's no reason I shouldn't be compensated for that knowledge of what I've had to go through to get to where I am today. It was only because I was persistent that I figured things out and because I called other dealers that didn't hang up the phone on me to ask them, how did you get through this? Cool. All right, Josh had to run, so uh, I took back over. Rod had a quick question. Yeah. Um, so, Michael, have you thought, because if you're going out in the speaker circuit and doing speaking of One Million Cups or wherever you're going, whatever it is, but have you thought about putting that into a continuity course to where you can give, you know, record your speeches or do them independently other ways that you just go out and put that into a, a monthly fee, you know, 10 bucks, 30 bucks, 37 bucks a month, whatever it is. And have these people follow you and get these the, the current advice. And that way you can reach a lot more people, even if it's just in Florida. Um, or if you want to go out and do it other ways, but you could have Florida specific advice or other states, or but I look at, at a way that you know was thought about, well, how do you scale? You know, well, what you can do is you can actually create a continuity course and say, hey, yeah, you want my advice? Join me here. There's a lot of platforms. It's really not difficult to set up. Have you thought about that? I haven't, but I am now. It, it's a way that you can scale yourself and still be a one-man guy, one-man band. I like it. Thank you for that recommendation, Rod. You bet. And if you want any you know, advice on that, just reach out. Is right. that your world? It's my world. I'm a story coach. I help people develop their story and then how they use it and how they can grow their business with it. Great. Thank you, Rob. We'll, we'll connect offline. All okay. right. And then uh, on top of that, Penny says uh, uh, you should set up a YouTube channel, which is not a bad idea. I mostly watch YouTube videos these days. I don't watch TV. So that's not a bad suggestion. Uh, and then <clears throat> I will finish up with the final question. You've probably heard this a lot of times before, but I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, how much can you get a 1989 Saab 900 Turbo for? <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> yeah, you know it's. Uh, uh, it, I think I think uh, our former speaker was Laura said it. Patience. Yep. I mean, you can you can go out and find cars for all prices right now. Like, 
you could find a ten thousand dollar car or a hundred the same car for a hundred thousand. So I think you know you have to just you have to be patient. It's what I've had to do in my world. Um, you know, people ask me where do I find cars? I find cars everywhere. I was driving to go see a car one day. I saw somebody's garage open. It was a car that I knew, and I stopped and knocked on the door and talked to the person. So, you know, there's so many places. You have to just be, you know, have to look everywhere, to be honest with you, Eric. Cool. And then the real question is, what else can we as a community do for you? I just keep doing what you're doing. I'm so glad um, that you guys are, you know, here, that you're meeting virtually. Uh, certainly, I would invite you to come be a part of, you know, Daytona Beach if you haven't had a chance already. And uh, Josh, I give him a shout out. He came uh, a couple of weeks ago, maybe a month ago now, and spoke in Daytona Beach. So, um, you know, we'd love to have you there, but I think at the end of the day, just keep rocking, keep grinding, you know, keep lifting up other people because, you know, when you succeed, I succeed and we all succeed. And I think at the end of the day, you know, that's, that's something to be part of and a proud of. All right. Perfect.